the lecture tonight by Professor Freddie Case. Uh, professor Case is a professor of real estate and urban land e economics, and he's uh, director of the real estate research program at the Graduate School of Business Administration. Uh, he uh, received his education at, the, at Indiana University, uh, <coughs> taught briefly in Florida, and has been here since 1951. In 1958, he was a visiting professor in Italy and, and then in Ireland. Uh, I have a biographical uh, sketch of him here, which is very long and lists many different areas of interest. Uh, he's uh, published a number of monographs. Uh, he's interested in various problems of real estate and uh, urban land economics. Uh, very recently, uh, there's been a publication as part of this real estate research program on minority families in the metropolis. Uh, I usually uh, leave the university to go home about uh, 6 or 6.15 when the traffic has died down, but every once in a while I have to leave at 5 o'clock. I'm a very impatient person and and as I sit on Wilshire waiting for the traffic to move, I look over at this new office building that's going up just east of Sepulveda and I think, my God, what's it going to be like when, uh, when that office building is finished and there are n additional cars leaving at 5 o'clock? Well, I, I'm sure you, I, I recently talked to somebody uh, from New York City and uh, who, uh, uh, is stationed here but but occasionally has to go to New York City and has been from New York. Uh, he uh, recounted his last uh, experience in New York City in the subways in uh, which he felt that the dehumanizing effect of subways pushing, shoving, and the noise were almost more than he could bear uh, again. Well there are many other things that that one could mention I think that uh, in reading about conservation and pollution, it is this human aspect of the problems that uh, is most often neglected. And uh, this is uh, Professor Case's subject, Man is, and His Environment, the Human Costs of Urban Wastes. If all of you will just hold good thoughts, maybe these machines will all work and I'll be able to get through this series. I've approached this evening with some trepidation because I've been sitting in on the rest of the lectures to find out what would be left for me. I think I have one or two things maybe that were overlooked. But uh, as you'll recall, uh, this entire series was sparked by the question, <clears throat> can man survive in Los Angeles? Now by way of summary, uh, if you recall Professor Logan, he said that uh, what we find in Los Angeles is almost entirely a man-made environment that we brought practically everything except the sand, the sagebrush, and the climate. Along that line, it's interesting to notice in 1690 there was a geographer who had visited California and Southern California had this to say. <clears throat> the island parts thereof, because they thought this was an island, were afterwards searched into and being found to be only a dry, barren, cold country, Europeans were discouraged from sending colony colonists to the same, so that it still remains in the hands of the natives, and there being nothing remarkable related either to them or to it, I shall proceed to Newfoundland. <clears throat> well, I don't know whether we've improved much since. Well, I think the main thing that we get out of this is that we do have the asset of a good Mediterranean climate, and if we choose, we can take advantage of that climate and uh, this area and probably produce one of the most attractive urban areas in the country. Now if we look at what professors Nyberger and Bush had to say, we find them warning us that uh, as we continue to gather here in rather large numbers that we are polluting one of the least replaceable of all of our assets and that is our clean, clear air. Now having lis uh, listened to them, I'm, I'm wondering whether we're going to live long enough to solve the problems related to getting breathable air again. And then when Professor Knudsen came along and joined them and their concern about whether we had a future, uh, I, and as we crowd together and I hear all the noise and honking, particularly in these traffic jams, I wonder myself. Well then Professor Pillsbury said that 
he felt we had enough water, we didn't need to worry about that. The only problem was the quality of the water. That we may end up with enough water, but to drink it would be a fate worse than death. But I think having listened to all of them, that I tend to feel that uh, technology has always proven equal to solving the problems that have threatened human existence. And I don't see any reason for believing that we can't purify our air or purify our water or control our noise so that we can produce an acceptable human environment. But then going to Mr. Hamilton and what he had to say, as you recall, he's the chief planning officer of the city of Los Angeles, we find him concerned with the fact that we have almost no planning in Los Angeles and that no planning has been associated with our urban growth. I'd be tempted to give planners equal time and say, maybe that's the reason we've done as well as we have, but I won't say that. <coughs> but his concern was about the lack of planning was also offset by the hope that he could probably marshal the people, the population, the resources of our city so that we could begin to direct our growth to achieve whatever goals we set for ourselves. In fact, as you'll recall from some of his exhibits, he'd already translated some of the goals and the plans for plazas, pedestrian malls, separated foot and automobile traffic areas, and greenbelt areas. But he did leave us with this one challenge, you'll recall. And he said, when and how are we going to decide where do we go for, from here? And he was mentioning not just the city of Los Angeles with which he's concerned, but all of Southern California. Well, can men survive in Los Angeles? I think the answers of those concerned with air, water, noise pollution planning say yes, it, he can survive, but it's going to cost. There will be a price attached to it. Now, from my viewpoint, I think that's really the important question because I'm an economist. And I'm always concerned with price, and I ask, and I would like to know, what is going to be the price? Is there a possibility, for example, that the price, as they mentioned, that is going to be too high? But more importantly, I'd like to know what are we going to buy at the various prices that are proposed for making this a reasonable environment? Should we really pay any more to secure a better Los Angeles urban environment? Haven't we paid enough? In fact, in a more facetious vein and yet serious at the same time, it might be well to ask whether we might not do better just to return the, the land to its original native uses or maybe deport a portion of our population or severely restrict our population, since, as far as I can tell from what they've said, people are the chief cause of pollution. I sometimes get the uneasy feeling that city planners feel that if they could just get rid of the people, we'd have good cities. But the thing that I want to concentrate on this evening, unlike what they concentrate on, is simply the question, what are we paying for what we have and what we hope to have in terms of the human resources that are being spent? Now, Southern California, particularly the Los Angeles metropolitan area, I think represents the largest totally man-made environment in the world. And it promises to become one of the most extravagant, uh, I think sprawling, almost impossible megalopoli by the year, 19, or by the year 2000. I'd like to show you what our, our State Department of Finance thinks about our population projections. Ah, works. We can see here, these are the latest estimates of what's going to happen. For example, in Los Angeles County, 1960, we had about 6 million, 65, 6.8, 7.3, and you can see the succession of growth going over to 10.6. I corrected this chart just last week because one of the more interesting things is that Orange County is growing at an even greater rate than had been anticipated as late as 1960. So you can see when we end up here, we have about 16, 18, about 20 million people that will be concentrated in the six Southern California counties. That means that we're going to have a pretty good sized metropolis. In fact, the metropolitanization of this area will probably extend from somewhere around Santa Barbara to San Diego, over to Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, and back. Uh, but that gives you an idea of what we anticipate for the future. Well, then I think that if we have created the environment, I tell you, you might leave the lights off regularly. That noise bothers me. Does it bother you? It scares me. Or maybe I should leave it on so you stay awake. Uh, but I think if we've created the environment that exists up to 1965, uh, then there's a possibility we can change it for the future. But then when we look 
at what will already, what is already here, and what's going to be here, for example, by 1970, our planning year, the question is, can we really make any changes? Or are the costs of change becoming more remote and more costly? Now, another thing about Los Angeles is that it's often described as 80 suburbs in search of a city. The critics talk about our fragmentation. And I think that all we, although we do realize that there are some 82 political communities in the county, at least I think there was this morning, and you know, I didn't read the paper this evening. What we really have, though, in Los Angeles is a series of 135 socioeconomic communities. That is, 135 communities that have very distinctive population and economic characteristics. Um, and this is the way I want to look at Los Angeles because this is really the human view of Los Angeles. I don't know whether you've seen a map much like this very often, but this is the map, for example, used by the Welfare Planning Council in looking at the welfare and human assistance programs that are needed in the community. I think that uh, what we have here then is clearly the heart of our problem. That is 135 identifiable socio-economic com communities. And the important thing is, as more and more people come, as their economic change, uh, changes occur, then these communities are going to be constantly changing in size and number and shape. I think that these communities, in a way, are a reflection of our failures because they represent our failure to match our political environment with our economic and social environment. Because they, these communities do cross political boundaries, then what we need is a great deal of cooperative political solutions to our problems. But so far in Los Angeles, so far as I can tell, we have chosen to avoid our problems. Or to put it another way, we think we are solving our human problems by simply creating more political boundaries. So this evening, I, pro I propose to raise a number of questions and to give very few answers. But I hope there are questions that, with which you might be com concerned. For example, if we're going to wait until 1970 to do any significant planning, then what are the costs, monetary and human, of waiting until that time? Will we, in view of what's expected in the way of population growth, be able to take our destiny and plan our future, or have we already waited too long? For example, if we know that Southern California is becoming increasingly attractive to all urban dwellers, then what's the future going to bring? I think there's one way of looking at this, and that is by looking at the anticipated rates of world and uh, national urbanization, and then comparing these in, to some extent with the use capacities of Los Angeles County and Southern California. For example, we must remember that according to present use standards, uh, maybe the county could hold uh, 8 to 10 million people. But according to some of Mr. Hamilton's estimates, there's a possibility that we could get 23 million people here. Now, this may seem astounding, but this is still only 6,000 people per square mile. I think that you would be interested in knowing in a place like Calcutta or the cities of India, you get about 400,000 people per square mile. So we have a little bit of room. But normally, an average of 6,000 people per square mile will produce many areas in the city of 100 to 150,000 people per square mile. So there are a series of charts I'd like to show you on this. Can you turn off the stage lights? Is there somebody done back there somehow? This is an idea of how the country would probably finally be arranged in terms of its urbanization. The details are not important, but the thing that I want to call to your attention is here is the West Coast. And this darkened area represents some of the heaviest urbanization that we're likely to find in the country. Ah, between now and about the year of 2000. So you see we're going to have a big urban area here. We're going to have spots of urban settlement along here and another big urban area here. When we talk about megalopolis, this is what we mean, an area of this kind stretching, you see, along almost the entire coast of the United States. This is the northern boundary of the United States. This includes practically the whole uh, state of California. To put it another way, to show you how population is increasing, we have this particular chart of population growth as it's anticipated. This is the world population from 1500 to 1965. 
And then at this time, in about the year 2000, for example, these are the kinds of cities that we expect. This proportion of about one uh, population, uh, cities with population of over one million, settlements of 100,000 to one million. So you see, with the ability of our population to go something like that, we can expect the whole world to be covered with cities of the kind we have in Los Angeles. Or to look at it another way, in terms of urban growth, this dark line here is the growth of cities with one million or more. And it would look like between now and the year 2200 that the most rapid rates of growth are going to incur right in these centers here. In fact, uh, I know you've heard of the phrase the continental tilt, and I often say that the continental tilt refers to the fact that anyone who is at all uh, able is going to eventually end up in California so that we can anticipate a condition in which maybe 20% of the population of the United States is located right in our part of the country. Now, I don't know how you would view this. To me, I think it presents some interesting challenges at least. Well, assuming the most modest rates of increase, how well can we contain the population of the year 2000? Well, you see by the year 2000, it's possible that the county of Los Angeles would be at about 96% capacity. Then on down the line, Orange County about 88% capacity, San Diego 81%, Riverside 62, and so on. It's interesting, for example, just to look at the year 1970 when we're going to start to do our first planning. The county of Los Angeles about 73% uh, at 73% of its use capacity, Orange County at about half, San Diego at about half, and then Riverside, San Bernardino, and so on at a little less. But it's interesting to notice, for example, that San Bernardino, one of the largest countries. In the, I mean, one of the largest counties in the United States with a, uh, an absorption there of about 23% of its capacity. Well, this is what we face in Los Angeles. A great deal of our planning has already been done. And whatever we wait to do in terms of planning, there is planning now going on, for example, by freeway engineers, private track developers, school boards, public works commissioners, varieties of public and, pri uh, public and private speculators and investors. And these kinds of activities are producing our city without any explicit city planning. If these uses are going to be changed then by in 1970, I shudder to think of what the cost will be in terms of time and money. But more importantly, it seems to me that since most of Los Angeles County will already be in use, that the primary function of the urban planners as it has always been in the past, will be simply to cure the mistakes of the past rather than to anticipate the problems of the future. I don't know whether you realize what, what is really happening to us and our natural resources here, but for example, recently, Under Secretary of Interior, after visiting California, had this to say. In a single generation, we have ruined the superb climate of Southern California. Some shorelines foam with detergents. Fish and wildlife are threatened and scenic beauty is destroyed. Cities slobber over into the countryside, cluttered with billboards, spawning sleazy developments that have brought new ugly words to our California lexicon. Slurbs and slurbovia. The shores of Lake Tahoe, the jewel of the Sierra, already bears the permanent scars of uncontrolled, unplanned commercialism unchecked. What a price to pay for so-called civilization. Now the interesting thing is though that the kind of, this kind of waste that we find here has been uh, found in most urbanization that's occurred in the United States. At a recent congressional hearing, for example, on urban problems, estimates were made that urban decay and waste in our major cities could be eliminated only at a cost of $3 trillion. Not including these estimates, for example, were the cost of providing for pure air and pure water. Furthermore, there's good reason to believe that in a city like Los Angeles, that our current rates, annual rates of new construction are barely sufficient to meet our new needs and probably not sufficient to, in addition, replace properties that are being abandoned, demolished, destroyed, or decayed each year. Again, maybe it wouldn't be too unreasonable to suggest that Los Angeles and many other of our urban areas should be allowed to rot in peace or be burned or be demolished in their entireties. For example, San Francisco and Chicago both suffered disastrous fires early in their history, and today they aren't much the worse for their early burning. 
And in Europe, many cities were burned and bombed during World War II, and today they've returned, I think, to more glory than that could have been expected from their pre-war decayed condition. But of course, if we're going to be practical and realistic, we know that we can't destroy Los Angeles. Although wholesale departure from Los Angeles our more afflu affluent population to more rationally constructed human areas might be expected. A publicly supported program for abandonment of Los Angeles might not seem realistic. But the fact is that many of our population are leaving our central city. Air pollution, decay, dirt, ugliness, traffic jams, freeway construction, new technologies, and a new affluence are joining to produce one of the most astounding mass migrations in modern history. The financial imperatives for holding our urban decay and discouraging this mass abandonment are important, but I don't think they're the primary reasons why we should do something. Not only is our urban growth polluting our environment, but it is also threatening a major segment of our human resources. The movement of populations away from our urban centers, unfortunately, are being spearheaded by our most affluent, our most contributing families. For example, in New York City, the population declined by 856,000 between 1950 and 1960. More importantly, however, more than 1.3 million upper income white families left the city, indicating that their places were taken by at least 400,000 low income non-whites. In Los Angeles, the migration of affluence to the suburbs is particularly marked. At the present rates of change in Los Angeles, the city is going to truly become a central area of the poor, connected only by the necessities of politics to the suburbs of the rich. Unfortunately, this tendency is not unique to us, but represents a, a growing disease in all of our major cities. So for example, just here, arbitrarily selecting some cities, here's Los Angeles. The white areas with the black borders represent the poor of our cities and the solid black areas represent the rich of our cities. So we can see that the central areas, and if we have drawn this by years, we would find that those central areas are growing as the affluent people move to the uh, peripheries of the city. Well, I think that this scatteration and this stratification of our population is a disease that's approaching epidemic proportions in Los Angeles. It's quite clear that many Angelinos are solving their personal urban problems by fleeing from urban congestion, from decay and from ugliness. And I think that this scatteration is a disease that we should fear above all other urban illnesses because it's creating an increasingly divided society. If, as seems most certain, almost 90% of our California population will be living in urban areas soon, then depending on your philosophy, we either face a very dismal or a very challenging future. This division of our society means that the social, the economic, the cultural, the scientific contributions of a major segment of our population will not be realized. As this segment uh, that is being denied its rights of contribution increases, then a smaller proportion of those still living in the city will be forced to assume the burdens of supporting the city. In other words, present urban trends in Southern California are forcing an increasing proportion of our urban society to accept slums and ghetto-like living conditions and to adopt public dependency as a permanent way of life. Now, one of the many problems we face in, a, in trying to understand and appreciate our decay problems in Los Angeles is that our city is too often described in terms of attractive but misleading averages, so that the real contrasts of this city appear to be exaggerations when they're mentioned. For example, we think of Los Angeles primarily as a land of milk and honey, where everybody prospers. In 1965, for example, our average family home had a value of $20,000. The average family received an income of $7,000. The average number of persons per square mile was the lowest of any major city in the United States. But what we often forget is that there are some Los Angeles families who can take advantage of everything that the 20th century has to offer, are looking forward to the 21st century. But there are almost equal numbers of families that find that even sharing in, in the minimal advantages of this current century are impossible dreams. And let me show you what I mean by that.
here's a comparison of Los Angeles County averages with three LAs in, the United, in, uh, in Los Angeles County. I've taken East Los Angeles, South Los Angeles, and then because all of us talk so much about it, Watts, but Watts is only a little tiny area that is not reflective of the total problem. But notice, for example, uh, most of you at the present time, 93% of the population, are living uh, in sound homes. East Los Angeles, about 75% of the homes are sound. In 1960 and 1965, 65%. Notice that while for the average, the quality of housing is improving, for the unaverage, the quality of, of housing is declining appreciably. And notice also that as the housing declines, the, the occupancy of the non-white increases. Notice also that these areas of greatest decay are also the areas of our oldest housing. And here's an interesting thing, though, that if we try to look at the value of the occupied units, there is some decline in the value of the occupied units, but not a great deal. But notice here. Average number of persons per square mile in 1965 might be around 2,000 people per square mile. But in 1960, in East Los Angeles, for example, it was 12,000 people per square mile. In South Los Angeles, 12,000. In Watts, 13,000. Some of the areas of central East Los Angeles, it gets up to 15,000 people per square mile. In those areas, population densities run about 10 times the percentage uh, in the other areas of the city. Uh, finally, income. Notice what I mean by sharing in the affluence of this society. Between 1960 and 1965, the average income went up from about $5,100 to $6,800. But notice over here in Watts, it went up by about $300, from $4,733 to $4,736 in South Los Angeles. And not then notice also the uh, rates of employment. Well, this shows to some extent the degree to which scatteration is really creating a divided city. With increasing proportions of our population being denied access to our urban opportunities as well as the right to contribute to our city. Another way of looking at this is to look at some of the characteristics of our population as reflected in the 1960 census of population. And I might say as an aside, unfortunately, there are all kinds of funds to, to find out what's going on in the moon but uh, we have no funds to find out what's going on in Los Angeles. If I sound slightly bitter, it's only because I'm in the social sciences. All right, suppose we ask, let's take every census tract and try and find out where in the census tract 5% or more of the population is Negro, and we see something amazing here. This is where about 90% of our Negro population is concentrated. In other words, what we have here is, in effect, a compact and isolated community. We can look at this another way. What about tracts where 10% or more of the population has Spanish surnames? Where are they found? And again, this is where we find most of our Spanish American population living. To look at our city in another way, and these kinds of isolated communities that we have, Let's look at median family income. The dark represents families with incomes below $5,000. The red bordered areas represent uh, tracts in which families had $5,000 or more in terms of income. We can look at it another way. What about persons per square mile? In the dark areas, we find that we have an average of 10,000 people per square mile. In the red-bordered areas, we have approximately 2,000 people per square mile. I think that the costs of creating and maintaining these kinds of isolated communities are many and can be measured in many ways, but I think that uh, what we have to realize first is the tremendous proportion of our unused human resources that are gravitating to these central communities. We can see this, for example, by looking at unemployment rates in these communities as I've looked at them. This is the county, the city, and uh, the entire Los Angeles metropolitan region. We find that for the county as a whole, the 
white population had an unemployment rate of about 6.7 percent. When we get over to the non-white population, we see it running up to an average of almost 10 percent. We get over to the Spanish surname population, and we see that it, it goes up to around uh, 8, sometimes 7 percent. So in these areas, then, we have a high proportion of unemployment, or people, in other words, who are contributing nothing in terms of the economic health of our uh, population. But more than that, we find also that what we are doing is putting these people in housing that is obviously not in the best of condition, to say the least. So we look, and for example, the sound housing is indicated by this line here. This is the total of sound housing in Los Angeles County. This is the sound housing occupied by white families. This is the sound housing occupied by non-white. And this is the sound housing occupied by Spanish surnames. It's interesting to ask, for example, how much can you expect anyone to contribute if they come, come out of a house that is obviously decayed and dilapidated, lacking most of the facilities that, most of, that you and I would take for granted? I think then that what we do is simply to compound our problem then by making sure that the com there will be a complete isolation of these communities, that we will isolate these unused decaying resources by simply surrounding them with high walls that transform them into series of small isolated cities. So that, for example, let's look at our map of the Negro population. And then let's put on that map our major freeway systems. Or suppose that we take the low-income families and put them on our freeway system. And notice that how nicely then our various kinds of families that perhaps should have more communication are being denied this communication simply by the freeway system that is being created by the freeway planners. Well, of course, as you could guess, we can also do this with the Spanish surname population. And notice how nicely we have isolated our minority families on one side and one section of the town and created enough freeways to make sure they stay there. Well, we have managed to do that so far. Imagine what we might have if we had let our, po our population get to 23 million, the uh, capacity that Calvin Hamilton has proposed. Of course, as I understand it, smog is lethal. And there are certain areas in which smog is most likely to happen. And there is one possible solution to the people living in these isolated communities. Based on what I was listening to from the other speakers, I made a map that would show the areas most susceptible to smog. And it seems to me that with the unused and unwanted resources of our community, to some extent we are solving some of our problems with our freeways and our smog. Well, I think it was right then that this series should be addressed to the fact, can we survive in Los Angeles? I think the answer is, uh, uh, undeniably, that yes, we can survive. But I think that's the wrong question to ask. What we have done to date in Los Angeles is survive. In directing our attention, for example, strictly to the question of survival, we've managed to create a city in which we treat the undesirable elements of our community much as we used to treat the undesirable persons a century ago. We've isolated them within walled, walled communities. So the 15 to 25 percent of our population is living in old, decayed housing in areas most susceptible to the forms of pollution to which an, area, uh, an urban area can be subjected. Our problem is that we have created an urban environment within which a significant segment of our population cannot buy nor rent the quality of housing and neighborhood environments that they want and that they can afford, that the families who do, do, who do not, that there are families who do not get the quality of housing or urban living for which they are paying. 
and we have a society that apparently does not let them move to those areas or to that kind of housing that they might want. The growth and dispersal then that we have depended upon in our past to solve our urban ills simply isn't available to us anymore. We can't flee the problem. We're running out of space. We simply don't have the space nor the facilities to accommodate further scatteration. And the thing is that using dispersal as a solution doesn't make life any easier nor more pleasant for those who cannot disperse. Scatteration, as it's practiced here, simply spreads our urban problems and does not return an important segment of our urban population to the levels of productivity that we need for a successful urban future. Although technology uh, promises to give us clean air and pure water, faster freeways, better city plans, it cannot deal with the fundamentals of human resource waste. As Lewis Mumford has written in his History of Cities, though there have been a multitude of studies of urban disorder and de decay, the few that attempt to deal with urban health and to establish better norms for growth and development are still, for the most part, innocently utopian in their unqualified belief in the dubious imperatives of an expanding economy. Likewise, in their conceiving as all important and all sufficient, the role science and techniques could play in the city's future development. Our task then, in his words, is to put the highest concerns of man at the center of all his activities, to unite the scattered fragments of human personality, turning artificially dismembered men, such as bureaucrats, specialists, experts, depersonalized agents, into complete human beings, repairing the damage that has been done by vocational separation, by social segregation, by the over-cultivation of a favored function, by tribalisms and nationalisms, by the absence of organic partnerships and ideal purposes. This sets the chief mission of the city of the future, that of creating a visible regional and civic structure designed to make man a home with his deeper self and his larger world, attached to images of human nurture and love. Well, I think that our failure to date to manage our Southern California urban resources adequately is simply accelerating the decay of these resources and the people who use them while increasing at a geometric rate the costs of solving our urban problems. I think at the core of our inadequacies lies simply our constant process of reacting to our urban problems, as, for example, indicated with problems of curing what's happened, instead of managing our problems, as would be indicated by anticipating and preventing our urban problems occurring. I think before we rush into the construction of some of the physical structures and physical planning that's held out as so great we must realize in many cases these perpetuate our mistakes. For example, with the kinds of resources we have in this Southern California, it's a wonder that we don't move more into experimentation with urban, li urban living so we can find the kind of living that's most conducive to the achievement of the varieties of urban or of individual goals and needs that we do find in our urban population. In fact, I would ask, why don't we create an experimental society? I think that we have to move away with our constant attention on and delight with the average people and the average solutions and move into the hardcore of problems concerned with individual differences. For example, James Rouse, who served at one time to the president as an advisor on housing, he's president of the Community Research and Development Company of Baltimore, has raised the kinds of questions about urban, li urban living to which I think we must address ourselves if we're going to avoid the future waste of human resources, and if we're going to achieve a rebirth of cities on a human scale. For example, is the mixing of people, economically, culturally, racially, within a community important to those individuals' growth? If so, then in what manner and what size communities would it be most influential? Is individual participation in and responsibility for a community important? What is the smallest size community group that draws people to participation? What kind of neighborhood or community gives people the greatest feeling of security and comfort? And what does such a neighborhood need in facilities and institutions? How can a community focus on the development of individual talents and capacities, and at the same time help develop emotionally secure and tolerant people? What about adults and their educational needs? How can the community provide a continuing program of adult education that will help cor correct individual obsolescence as it occurs in our quickening pace of technological advance. 
And then by way of conclusion, I think that as long as we are planning for roads and houses and facilities, then why don't we include a little planning for people? Why don't we include in our planning some concepts about social zoning so that we can talk about socially desirable goals? What is wrong with using planning for achieving urban living on a human scale? In conclusion, then, I think that this, I would say that this is not a new problem, because going back to the classics, we find that Sophocles, concerned about this problem, said simply, the city is people. <laughs> How do we get the lights on? I thank Professor Case for a very well-planned lecture. It was really the frosting on the cake as far as this lecture series goes. Uh, we're open for questions. Uh, what do you attribute the uh, research predictor planning about it? It's just like Topsy. I think it'd be interesting to look at uh, what that kind of centralization is doing. Here's a map of downtown Los Angeles. Don't bother with the lights. This is what uh, downtown Los Angeles looks like. Two thirds of it devoted to parking lots, streets, and freeways. And so while you talk about a resurgence of the central area, it's the resurgence around the periphery of the central area. And what is being replaced in the central area probably is about equivalent to what used to be there. Uh, there will be some recentralization. Just know they're making another study at Bunker Hill. Uh, I, I happened to get a hold of an old 1930 report about Bunker Hill. And one very wise man had been looking at downtown Los Angeles. He noticed that there were streetcar tracks and railroad tracks leading into Los Angeles, central Los Angeles, that weren't used in the evenings. And he noticed that there were a lot of freight cars sitting around that weren't used in the evenings. So he suggested that the solution to Bunker Hill would be to bring the freight cars in on the tracks in the evening and dig away and take away the whole darn hill. I'm sorry he didn't get his way, because we're going to do it anyway. Yes. He says that's a capacity. I think he agrees with with me at least, that uh, that's an impossible uh, figure. Well, the, no, the present zoning capacity, you know. Well, the present zoning capacity would take around 10 million. If we just maximize the use potential with multi-family lots, we could probably get 23 million here. When I say no planning is going on, we have no master plan. Whatever goes on, goes on by pits, bits and pieces so that we're not sure right now where each bit and each piece is going to fit in that total master plan. And the thing I ask is that by the time the Citizens Committee's report in in 1970 with what they'd like to see in the city, all we have left is about 25% of the county, and that's some of the least desirable element, uh, sec sections of the county. Suppose the citizens recommend that the Santa Monica Mountains be returned to a park. Yes, ma'am. Carl, he said that the final plan would not be ready for public view until 1970. I think he has an impossible job on his hands. I, I think that you should have all sympathy for Mr. Hamilton and his problems and try to make him, help him accelerate what he wants to do because we're sure doing nothing now. Yes. Seems to me that I think that it isn't just downtown interests, but we have any number of interests, each of which has been able to work its influence to get what it wants out of the city without asking what is the total impact on the whole city. And the thing I point to as the worst possible thing happening to us is our freeway system. Because our freeway system quite literally is creating a system of walled, isolated communities that makes it difficult to for us to use this city in any uh, reasonable fashion in terms of its land use pattern. As I keep saying, the only thing I think about with respect to freeway planning is it must be people who don't like cities because they fix it so that we can go right through them and never see them. And I think that uh, this is something that I think about. What can we do? Well, uh, uh, for example, we could stand a lot more interest in citizen participation. The homeowners, property owners groups, for example, need their support because, uh, again, we have a city without planning so that an affluent group with a good representative can pay him $25,000 a year to go in and encourage action that that affluent group wants. This is not uh, an illegal, immoral, or anything else. It's the way our system works. In the lack of any kind of master plan, there's no defense against the persuasiveness of affluence and good display.
don't have any kind of united public interest, concern, or indignation about much of anything. Uh, if you recall, Mr. Hamilton mentioned those maps that were drawn by the residents of various areas. I've seen those maps, and I wish that I could have made miniatures of them because, again, they fit with our freeway system, indicating that, to some extent, the map drawn by the person reflects the limitations of the freeways within which he lives. That uh, we are a divided community, and as we do certain things, we are creating more of a divided community in which, uh, into the vacuum, a lot of decisions about land uses are being made with people who have special interests that have nothing to do with the good of the whole Southern California region. Uh, what uh, form of transportation? Would I don't know. I'd get into the question of freeways, but I just like to think of the city of Florence. When I was there. They were faced with what should we do about autom automobiles and our problem. I was uh, recall they had to do some rebuilding, and their answer was, "We won't do a darn thing. We'll leave our medieval city the streets there." And if you've been in Florence, you know. Everybody comes in until everybody is stopped and just jammed and you don't go any place. And that's the way they solve their, their problems. To some extent, I think we might solve some of our problems by refusing to build any more freeways and making it extremely costly and difficult to use them, much more costly and difficult than it is, so that we'd get more concerned about our urban problems. Because if you look at some of the maps that are planned for Los Angeles, we may end up with freeways that are approximately every four miles apart and a complete waffle across the whole Southern California area. And you figure that, uh, as I recall from some of the statements, the freeway might be about a half a mile wide or a quarter of a mile wide, and then the pollution from the freeway extends for half a mile on either side, and you can see what we're going to do. We're just going to have little pockets where you can get away from some of the pollution from freeways. I'm not against freeways particularly, except that they do affect our city. I was, I was a We sure do. <laughs> oh, here, this uh, gentleman, right? I don't know this comes away anymore. <laughs> but, uh, another comment. In some ways, if we don't overdo it, I think you have to understand that to get on that freeway and enjoy its advantages, you have to have a family income that's at least average. So, by definition, there's around 40% of our population that can't afford those freeways but are suffering all the worst of impact of them because they are living in the areas where the freeways concentrate most heavily. And yeah, on an average, freeways are the best way of traveling. On an average, most families get benefit from the freeways. But again, my point is that Los Angeles is no longer a city of averages. It's becoming more and more a city of extremes. So either the rich or the poor are going to be here, and uh, there's not going to be a happy meeting ground for them at all. Yes. I think, uh, no, that we stand with the majority of cities in, in being uh, inadequate in our planning. Uh, some of the best examples of planning would have to be found in Europe, I think. Uh, to some extent, I think London has faced up to this problem, and we could look to London. Uh, if, if, if any of you have been to London, or if you ever take a map of London that shows land uses in London, and look at, for example, the tremendous amount of green belt area, free space, open space they have. Probably the only city in the world that really faced up this problem has been Rotterdam. And as you recall, it was just destroyed utterly and it had to start from scratch, so they started out with some pretty good ideas and developed a pretty good city. Aren't but we beginning with some good responses like, for instance, New Haven and Boston? Under Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, St. Louis to a little to some extent. St. Louis got itself in a mess and was trying to move out of it. So there are a few cities where something is being done. But uh, we're, we're finding out, you know, we're getting too late smart, too soon old, uh, that sort of thing. I suppose it might be, it's one way. Yeah, and the squares go to high rise. He's suggesting that if the city becomes divided by the freeways, then perhaps we put green belts a half mile on each side, then in the middle of the squares, do some kind of imaginative high-rise development with connections over the freeways and so on. It might be, uh, it might be a solution. Uh, I just keep thinking, though, that if that is not the solution, think of the cost of removing these freeways. We were, be we were able to bury the old uh, Pacific Electric tracks in most cases, but what are we going to do with these freeways if we find out they're the wrong thing in 1970? The wrong place, the wrong size, or something else. And this is, again, my point. Our planning is being done by the freeway engineers. And if you've been in a citizen's group opposing freeway engineers, you know they do the planning. Well, regarding the plan, uh, 
find it, and if there's an engineer here, I certainly stand to be corrected, but in trying to ask them how do you decide where to put a freeway, they start with the physical considerations first, the easiest physical route. And then they get a number of physical routes, and then they ask what are the costs of the alternative routes in terms of earth, terms of earth moving, uh, moving houses, and so on. So if you're going to put freeways through the city and run them through central Los Angeles and east Los Angeles, you'll find that there are certain routes that are le the least expensive because you can remove the worst kind of dilapidated housing that's decayed and should be removed anyway. And so there begins to develop some coincidence between the walls of our freeways and the walls that surround our minority populations. And it's not an intent. I don't think anybody is really intending to do this. It's just the basic ways that are involved in planning freeways. Did you have it? Now, South Central Los Angeles means uh, roughly 180,000 family units. Uh, there are sections of South Central Los Angeles where homeowner, homeowners, the ownership of homes represents maybe 60 to 70 percent of the residential occupancy. There are other areas where it represents maybe only 20 percent. So that's one facet. Now, for the income units that are owned, we found that either through the places where the tax bills were sent or by talking to tenants or by looking at public records, that roughly one-third of the uh, income units in South Central Los Angeles are occupied by the people who own them. One-third, roughly, are occupied by people who live in the same postal zone. One-third are occupied by people who live outside the postal zone. Of the one-third who live outside the postal zone, uh, apparently about two-thirds of them live somewhere in Southern California. Put another way around, there isn't enough good slum property to attract the absentee landlord who buys up large blocks of tenements and tries to exploit the people. We're fortunate in that extent because this is all primarily old single-family home districts that have been converted and the houses are converted. So uh, you find a Negro family, the husband and wife work, uh, say, on some kind of civil service jobs, the total family income maybe comes to $10,000 a year. They add to that then by buying an old house next door and uh, converting it into a series of apartment units. And I might say along that line, too, incidentally, that the average rentals paid in South Central Los Angeles for, say, one bedroom, two bedroom apartments. So on the rental schedules, they're the same as any other part of the county, practically. But the quality of the housing that's, got, that's obtained for that price is something entirely different. Incidentally, We've all talked about what, we've all talked about South Central Los Angeles. I don't find one person in 10 who's ever been down in there to drive through and find out what's there. Yeah, I suggested it. South Central Los Angeles. Quality. And with the assistance of some federal funds, do something about it. One of the people, for example, who's going to be a part of that is John Bugs. You may recall he went from here, our county commission on human relations. He's heading that up. Uh, people look at this program with mixed feeling. It seems to have great promise, but to date there hasn't been much coming out of it. Maybe it's too soon, but we certainly hope so. <laughs>